Hello, and welcome to This Week in Sociological Perspective. I'm your host, Samuel Realmfield Lucas. This week, we discuss a woman in England who uses her drone in service to others. But first, I recently spoke with Professor Scott Duxbury of the University of North Carolina about his recent paper titled, The Boys in Blue Are Watching You, The Shifting Metropolitan Landscape and Big Data Police Surveillance in the United States. The paper is to be published in Social Problems and is co-authored by Nafisa Andrabi. Before I get to the interview, if you're watching this on YouTube, I have three brief requests to make and one offer to extend. My requests? If you find the show or episode interesting, please like, subscribe, and comment. My offer? If you want to receive no more than one email a week with a link to the new TWISP episode, click the link in the description and then enter your email address. By doing this, you assure you will be notified no more than once a week about new TWISP episodes. Thanks. I appreciate it. Professor Duxbury, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. So your paper studies factors associated with the use of big data policing. Mm -hmm. And it also studies uh, the relationship between segregation and policing. Mm -hmm. To get started, what is big data policing? That's a great question. <laughs> so there's kind of the broad strokes thing about it. And then there's kind of um, what we were trying to do to get, to get a handle on some of these bigger ideas. So the crux of what big data policing is, is over the past 10, maybe 15 years, well, we could even trace it back as early as 9-11. Um, police departments have poured more and more money into essentially capitalizing on growing availability of digital trace data, um, machine learning, kind of predictive algorithms to figure out where crime is most likely to happen, to predict crime before it happens, and to try to get police to either reduce response times or even um, prevent the crime before it occurs. And so these big data policing tactics have had a number of implications for police behavior. Um, they've affected how kind of gotten police to create new databases that store even online activity. So increasingly, um, police are asking uh, suspects for Twitter handles when they pull them over and link this to online databases so they can monitor online browsing activity and things like this. So it's on one hand kind of this uh, very much a technological thing, right? We're in the technological era. And so police are very much riding that wave, incorporating technologies where practical to kind of change their routine activities, but on the other actually affecting the routine behaviors of police as well, the types of data they're collecting and how they're using it to follow up on suspects. So what kinds of things, uh, are there things that the public can see that constitute this big data policing and other things they can't? Is it all invisible? Is, is it all visible? It's both. It's both. And so this is one of the kind of um, very interesting things about big data policing, because the big data surveillance type of thing, what we often think is, okay, minority report, right? We have people who are plugged into the machine, they're predicting where crime is going to happen, and it's all like this kind of clandestine, faraway place. And that's kind of, some of it is kind of like that. We have these institutions like real time crime centers. We increasingly have police using facial recognition software to identify people with outstanding warrants in live video streams. But the other thing about big data surveillance, this is true of the surveillance we're seeing in the criminal justice system, as well as in the workplace and other institutions like that, is that the surveillance is often bilateral. And so a lot of the tactics that we encourage police to adopt for the name of police accountability, like a body worn camera, actually ends up being used to increase police surveillance. So we have like a camera on their chest. On one hand, it's great for us because we get to monitor police behavior and say, okay, you know, this is unacceptable conduct. There's more public accountability. At the same time, police oftentimes aren't throwing that live stream footage out. They're trying to make the most of it. And so once the footage becomes available, they start using more and more software to uh, mine that footage in order to predict or identify um, outstanding warrants on people and also to store it in queryable databases. Other times, this type of surveillance tactic is semi-observable. So uh, Chicago, for instance, is one of the most highly surveilled cities in the world now. There's, I believe, a police uh, closed-circuit surveillance camera on every corner of downtown. 
Um, and so you have to kind of be looking to find that. Um, other things seem very benign and are really uh, don't seem that offensive, like automated license plate readers. And, um, you know, the Durham uh, metro area where I am, Chapel Hill recently switched over to automated license plate readers. On one hand, it's not the most offensive technology, but on the other, once you start having these license plate readers all over downtown, you've got to store the image data, you've got to process the image data, and all these things end up building towards kind of more constant surveillance and especially digital surveillance. I see. So how does segregation enter the discussion? I mean, what do our theories say is the relationship between segregation and policing in general? I mean, before, you know, before, as, before you did your work, what were those theories saying? And about segregation and policing in general, or if they even said anything about segregation and big data specifically? That's a great question, Sam. Um, so it's people, there's been a lot of work on segregation and policing, but one of the interesting things is that often we don't get a consistent answer from what we should expect. So kind of one of the things we were trying to tease apart in our study was thinking about, okay, how is segregation impacting policing? Because for the most part, people haven't really been talking about segregation and big data policing in particular. And what we were finding is that we get these kind of inconsistent answers. So on one hand, we know predominantly black or brown neighborhoods are over-policed and underprotected. So the police go there more frequently, but they're also less likely to kind of serve the types of um, order maintenance, crime-stopping functions that are enjoyed in um, wider communities. And so when we're looking at these type of tracked level qualitative studies where people are looking at specific neighborhoods or going to specific neighborhoods and observing police behavior, what we often find is that segregation plays a big role. You know, the more hom racially homogenous or ethnically homogenous a neighborhood is, the more aggressive the police behavior and the police oversight. But as we start moving up units of analysis, we start seeing these kind of um, interesting findings. Sometimes the relationship between segregation and policing at the county level is actually really hard to detect. At the city level, it's often inconsistent. Depending on the study you're looking at, some people are saying more segregation, more policing. Other people are saying no relationship. Other people are saying more segregation, less policing. And so it can all go in these different types of ways. And so when we were thinking about this relationship, we were trying to figure out, okay, are we thinking about segregation in kind of the classical sense where we're thinking about racial segregation and class segregation as being fundamentally intertwined? Or are we thinking about this in terms of what we're seeing as a divergence that's grown more and more prominent over the past 20 to 30 years, where we've had black upper middle classes moving increasingly out of inner cities and into the suburbs, which has contributed to a simultaneous growth of income segregation and a decrease in racial segregation? Well, so these theories that you, or these expectations that you indicated of, uh, that existed before, um, do they, I mean, do they have an explanation for why, you know, why you would expect it to go one way versus the other way? <laughs> yes, yes, no, that's a good question, Sam. Um, so it depends on who we're thinking about. So one vein of theory is essentially saying that, you know, the criminal justice system has increasingly played a role of perpetuating racial inequality. And this has become increasingly prevalent, especially since the 1960s, although it served this function a little bit before then. And according to this theory, essentially the idea has been that before the 1960s, 1970s, um, there was a certain amount of surplus labor, labor that could be extracted or kind of um, essentially manufacturing jobs, low-skilled labor that was um, necessary to fuel manufacturing in the U.S., but didn't require high education or something like that. And um, bl the Black working class contributed to this uh, kind of industry in a big way. And so before the 1960s, 1970s, segregation was a way to, um, as some scholars have argued, to essentially control racial minorities while simultaneously extracting the surplus. Now, as the U.S. has increasingly moved to service type jobs, professional type jobs, white collar jobs, manufacturing has gone overseas and things like that. Um, that role has kind of increasingly crumbled. Segregation has become less effective because on one hand, people need to be more mobile for work. And on the other hand, the manufacturing jobs that these kinds of racial enclaves are originally created to perpetuate um, are no longer as prevalent. 
And so the argument among this vein of uh, theory or ideas is that the criminal justice system has essentially expanded in lockstep. You know, incarceration rates have been going up since the 1970s. Uh, death penalty has been re-legalized, more and more police spending in general. And so in this vein of thinking, police surveillance is just one tactic among many. I mean, it's really not exceptional to police surveillance. Everything about the criminal justice system is about um, essentially regulating segregation. And as segregation gets higher, um, the criminal justice system needs to get higher as well in order to control racial minorities. So that's the one kind of idea. The other idea is that actually racial segregation in itself is a strategy to oppress racial minorities. And in this idea, this is sometimes called the racial threat hypothesis, that some type of institution or political be structure or behavior is going to emerge to control racial minorities when they're perceived as threatening. And so in this vein of theory, segregation itself is a social control mechanism. And as segregation begets more prevalent, we actually need less police surveillance because segregation is already filling that role. And so this is why we get this kind of inconsistent thing, right? So on one hand, we have our people saying more segregation, it needs more criminal justice oversight to control it. And on the other hand, we're saying, why would we need police? Segregation is doing the job in the first place. So this is kind of this uh, competing levers we're trying to tease out. The, the second one is called the racial threat hypothesis. Did the first one have a easy, you know, straightforward <laughs> name? Or I'm sure we're there called, are many people working in the, yes. in the line of work. So yeah, there's, it uses a label. Uh, we labeled it the carceral state hypothesis. Um, but yeah, I think other people could think of other names as well. <laughs> so... I can see that segregation, it's an, imp uh, it's a, it's a important touch point for both these theories and people's experience of the world. It, part of what you're saying, you're saying that the 20th century theories of policing focused a lot on race. They, the, especially the ones on segregation highlighted race. But part of your paper suggests that the focus is not quite right for 20th or first century conditions. That's so exactly. I guess the two questions that would follow is, well, does segregation no longer run along racial lines? Has it has it been uh, removed so much, or or more more generally, more fundamentally, what changes lead you to this position that you you aren't saying race isn't relevant, but it, it may or may not be. That's an empirical question, mm -hmm. but you're saying there's something else miss. Certain kinds of segregation are being missed, and that you're bringing that forward. So what's the thinking that leads that you to? turn to another dimension that might be a, a place of segregation? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Sam. So yeah, we've we've never been of the view that racial segregation doesn't matter. I mean, the U.S. is still highly segregated along race. It's prevalent. It's everywhere. But one of the things that I found um, a little kind of the thing that got me thinking about this was um, when we're reading these theories about how segregation works, what we're often hearing is descriptions along the lines of you know, uh, racial enclaves, neighborhoods where different racial groups don't come into contact and are also experiencing concentrated disadvantage. So if we stop momentarily and kind of flip from the theoretical description to what's actually being measured in most papers, the papers are measuring where are people living in terms of racial demographics, but not actually the economic component, the concentrated disadvantage. And so that got us thinking like, wait a second, all these papers that have been studying segregation have been only looking at the frequency of contact, not the disadvantage itself. What are the resources? What are the jobs like? How much money are people making? So that got us kind of the idea. And we started kind of trying to pull this apart. What would we find if we saw or if we considered economic segregation and racial segregation separately and allowed them to interact and uh, in tandem as well? And what we started kind of increasingly coming to see is that there's some interesting things on the literature and policing. So for on one, on one hand, we know that police contact often has the worst consequences, the most negative consequences for young black men. But on the other, if we're looking at attitudes towards the police, support for police, once you control for um, class background, then actually the racial differences get really, really small. And so it's this interesting thing where increasingly we're coming across these studies looking at perceptions of police, belief that police protect and serve the community, support for having police officers around, and the economic factors started becoming more and more and more salient. We we're also kind of turning to this literature on um, what's called quality of life policing. 
And essentially what this research is talking about is that since especially the year 2000, police have had these really, really big budgets, but crime has been steadily declining. So what are they doing with the money? And what the quality of life policing uh, argument is, is essentially police are increasingly used to support business, especially in commerce areas. And so police are increasingly stationed in downtown districts, not with the goal of actually making inner city residents feel safer, but making the suburbanites who travel downtown to shop and to work feel safer. And then, of course, they can leave again and go home. And so that got us thinking again, what is it about this relationship between the suburbs and inner cities? And that brought us back to this class segregation thing. As the suburbs are increasingly diversifying, we're seeing um, a decrease in racial segregation associated with suburbanization, but a simultaneous increase in economic segregation. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Before you can even ask the question of what's the relationship between big data policing and segregation, we just, did you, when you track big data policing over time, is it, I mean, you have data that is quite uncommon. So it's a maybe a maybe the earliest first good generalizable measure of big data policing. When you use this measure, do you see it changing over time? Oh yeah. It's actually a really stark increase. We um have data, so we looked at data starting in 2009. But you can go back, um, some of that data is available as early as the year 2000. And between 2000 and 2009, it's basically a flat line. And then in 2009, it just starts going like this. <laughs> yeah. So it's a really, really recent trend, past 10 years especially. So then you, you did engage these issues about the role of segregation. And what did you find? Well, what we found was that when we kind of, we compiled a few different measures, we had a measure of racial segregation, we had a measure of income segregation. We had a broader measure of income inequality. So we wanted to be sure it wasn't just kind of spatial dispersion of economic uh, wealth or whatever, but also kind of not just the inequality itself, right? Not just the um, differences in what people are making. And so what we found was there's some evidence for this threat idea or the threat hypothesis that as racial segregation goes up, um, the big data surveillance stays relatively low. Um, but it wasn't really that strong. The strongest finding we had was that as income segregation has increased, especially increased over time, there's been an associated increase in the scope of big data surveillance in metro areas. And one of the findings that we originally kind of had in the paper, but eventually through various revisions ended up um, getting taken out is the strength of that relationship is about as strong as a, um, having a terrorist attack in a metro area in the three years prior. So we thought that was kind of um, stark. It was a striking finding in our mind that that effect size would be so similar. Yeah, that's that's because you you did note in the paper that a terrorist attack does raise this big mm -hmm. data surveillance, and so it's equivalent to to that. Um, so when we, what about the carceral state hypothesis? Was that so the racial threat hypothesis? There's partial support, mm -hmm. and there's support for this income segregation role. So I guess if the carceral, maybe the carceral state hypothesis and the racial threat hypothesis are opposite. So if one is supported and the other is, is that the way it is? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. So <laughs> they may not be complete opposites, but yeah, right. So, are different. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the, it's one of those things. So in terms of the 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 way we're testing them, yeah, they're suggesting very, very opposite things. And we didn't find support for kind of the exact predictions put forward by the carceral state hypothesis. That being said, we, we kind of were very hesitant to say this does not support it because, um, you know, if you're thinking about what we were saying earlier, both theories are saying, yes, the criminal justice system is being used to perpetuate inequality. What they're disagreeing on is how. And so in both cases, we're finding evidence that as this class segregation is going up, and again, this is controlling for all these different things about police departments, the crime rate, police expenditures, police force size, number of officers, you know, all these different things. And we're still finding the segregation relationship. And that's quite striking. And so my guess is a lot of the people who's kind of in this carceral state camp um, would, would not be uh, too offended by the findings, right? This isn't rejecting the theory or anything. It's just suggesting it works one way rather than the other. Right. And it also this this I mean drives home this idea that you started with that things have changed in the 20th century compared to the past. And 
Um, it doesn't say that the theories of the past were wrong, but Absolutely. it was saying that we need a broader understanding or, or mm -hmm. bring different emphases. Big picture, though, what do your findings mean for how we should view contemporary policing and people's varied experiences of policing? What should we expect or you know, take away from this in terms of uh, know, having a sense of what's going on? Yeah, it's it's a hard one to figure out, I think, Sam, because... You know, um, I'm teaching criminology now, and one of the very first things I, I teach my students is, all right, what, what works for controlling crime? Is it formal social control? Is it what the state does? Is it what the criminal justice system does? Or is it everything outside of it? And the classical criminology thing is that most crime gets stopped without getting the criminal justice system involved at any point, right? Police are not actually all that effective at stopping crime. And so even if we're trying to make police, give them more and more money, um, outfit them with fancier and fancier equipment, it's frankly, it's just not the best thing that they can do. Um, what police are really good for is kind of um, providing assurances, making people feel safer and things like that when used uh, appropriately. So I think, you know, one of the things that concerned scholars in the 1990s when there was a push for zero tolerance and broken windows policing was that the emphasis on getting tough on crime would damage police community relationships. And the idea here is that one thing police can really do is make community residents feel safer and that empowers community residents to self-regulate in a greater capacity. And as long as we have kind of aggressive interventions and police, um, especially the further away they are from neighborhoods and not actually knowing neighborhood residents very well, that can all undermine police legitimacy and relationships with community members. So if we think about that problem we were confronting in the 1990s with all these kinds of aggressive policing tactics being renovated or re-envisioned, and we flash forward to today, we're seeing an increased prevalence of tactics that allow police to essentially stay anonymous, right? Big data surveillance lets you surveil a much wider area without actually having to know anybody or interact with anybody or establish any type of relationship. One thing that's really concerning about big data policing, um, and we know this happens a lot with predictive policing algorithms, is that they mine big data to figure out where crime is most likely to occur. They assign risk scores to different neighborhoods. And the types of data that they're using are things like census data and prior crime rates. And so what happens is if we know that poverty and disadvantage causes crime, and all of a sudden we're creating algorithms that learn that as well and then predict crime as a function of past crime, we are only increasing the problem of disadvantaged neighborhoods being over-policed and underserved because now we have algorithms essentially reinforcing this. And I, I'll, I'll segue slightly here, Sam, your question was kind of about policing, but I think this is a broader point that I'm always harping on when I'm talking about uh, computational sociology, whether I'm teaching it in the undergrad or graduate level. And that is we often like to think about these algorithms as removing human bias because machines don't process things the way we do. But if we put bias data in, and that is bias data created by humans, what we get is bias predictions. And so one of the things that people have been very concerned about, myself included, is that this kind of dependence on big data surveillance will not only amplify the policing biases we're seeing in terms of race and economic inequality, but can actually exacerbate it because people see it as an unbiased process when it fundamentally is not. Well, Professor Duxbury, there's a lot there to think about and um, a very illuminating take on what's going on now, uh, sort of liberating us from maybe some inability to see based on what we've, or the tools we had from the past. Um, so I wanna thank you for the work that you've done to, to get to establish this understanding and for your sharing it with us today. Thanks so much for having me on, Sam. Our final segment concerns a woman in England who uses her trone in service to others. The Good News Network headline read, Woman hailed as hero for using trone to locate over 200 lost pups for free. The September 18th article told one of the hundreds of stories of rescues. Apparently, on September 9th, a schnauzer named Hilda escaped her backyard garden. Her human companion spent two hours trying to find her, 
but then, in desperation, called Erica Hart. Ms. Hart abandoned her shopping trip to get on the case. She raced to the little dog's last known location and using her drone, quote, within 20 minutes, spied the escaped pooch running down a residential road. The little dog dashed into a field and kept going as Ms. Hart directed Hilda's companions to where they could intercept the little gal. Hilda was happily re reunited with her human family just as thunder began to roll in. Many may experience this episode as a heartwarming story. A sociological question to ask is, why? What social phenomena coalesce to make this story warm our hearts? One element may be the presence of 21st century technology in the story. Uh, uh, stay with me here. Specifically, the key technology of the drone. Ms. Hart uses this drone to find the little doggies. While many of us have seen amazing drone footage of uh, wonderful vistas, the implement can also be a nuisance. Rarely silent, it offers another potential erosion of sound privacy. It threatens to drown out the natural sounds of a sunny summer day, and to do so both right where we live, as well as in places people go to to be present. The beach, the lake, the mountain, the forest. There have even been instances when some news organizations have launched a drone to cover a wildfire, and by doing so, have prevented firefighters from deploying airplanes and helicopters to fight the fire. So, we often experience and understand drones as a nuisance. A common experience with new technology rolled out before we have completely accepted the losses its introduction can impose. But in this story, the drone is on the heroine's team. Ms. Hart would probably be far less effective if her vision was as groundbound as that of everyone else chasing the little dog. It may be refreshing to have a story where a drone does something constructive. It reminds us that the new tools we construct are not in control, we are. And despite appearances, we do have the capacity to use them with wisdom and, if necessary, to construct supports for productive use and prohibitions on nuisance and destructive uses. But this is not just a story of a well-used drone. Ms. Hart, a dog lover, is a true heroine of the story, generously giving her time, expertise, and passion in service to distraught humans and canines alike. She asks no payments. Quite the opposite, she invests her own money and time to help find the little lost pups. She said, quote, I've gone without stuff for myself to put petrol in the car to find a dog. But when I post it on Facebook and I see the comments, I lay in bed with a smile on my face and realize why I do it. So why is this story heartwarming? Perhaps because most of the news comes to us because people are operating with exactly the opposite kinds of motivation. But in a way, the self-centered motivation at the root of many news stories may be what makes those stories news, which would suggest that what is covered in the media does not jive with how most of social life is lived. Mostly, Social life is made up of people doing things or not doing things because they care for others, either nearby intimates or complete and total strangers. How can this be, one might ask, when the news, our record of what is happening, is loud, bloody, and conflictual? How can it be? I submit that the stories selected as news are misleadingly different from all that constitutes the full story of human experience. And my reasoning is that humans would have already driven themselves to extinction if social life really were as loud, bloody, and conflictual as the news makes it seem. There is no denying that Ms. Hart is a hero, but in every functioning community, there are many unsung heroes. For Ms. Hart's 
high profile and heartwarming way of engaging is mimicked in other, often less dramatic ways every day. The heart way of living, replicated in her community and in communities around the world, builds camaraderie and can make possible dozens of desirable downstream outcomes. In sum, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Ms. Hart and to those who live like her, for they positively influence us all, whether we walk on two legs or four. That's this week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be back next week with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care.